As if they don't have too much on their plates The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade They'll talk about the things they did that day They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rewind to SmackDown. John Pollock here alongside Wei Ting, uh, the Peter Parker to my, uh, oh, his friend. I just Ned. watched the movie. I don't even, Ned. Yes, that's me. How are you, Wei? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I, I wish I could have been in your position tonight because you managed to catch the premiere of Spider-Man Far From Home. You know, I almost messaged you, but I assumed you have already made your, your plans, but there was an extra ticket, and I thought of you. You were the oh. only person I thought of, but I, I assume that you would have made your plans already. Like, these Marvel films, like, you, you have, like, a, a set. I imagine this is built into your schedule. Actually, I, I was com- this one completely was kind of off of my radar. I, I don't really know why. You know what it is? Part of, part of it is because it, I feel like Endgame was, was such a crescendo. I was, this is backlash after WrestleMania or yeah. new beginning after Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was like, I think my my fandom was really at an all time high. My my anticipation for that film was at an all time high. That I feel like this one, I I was was a bit of a, you know, come down. And I I, I honestly I have to say I'm not as excited for it as obviously some of the ones that came before. But uh, after hearing all the reviews. And I, I'm I'm that much more excited about it, but I'm I'm looking forward to hearing the most important review of all, and that is yours. Well, as soon as Way allows me to talk about it, I will talk about. You it. can give a spoiler free, like just tell me your reaction. You don't have to even get into plot details. Do you like it? That's all. I definitely liked it. Yeah, there is. Um, I, I'm I'm so uh, I feel like I'm on eggshells here. I don't know I don't know what you're allowed to say. Tell like, me is it a st- if you like? Is it a, it's it's established that we have end credit scenes in every Marvel movie, right? Yeah. So stay for the end credits. I've already heard that. There's basically. a mid credit scene and an end credit scene. Okay. Mid credit scene got a big reaction, and that okay. was cool. Okay, that's all. You don't have to say it. Okay. Oh, did I go too far? No, did no, no. Th- that's just it's it's fine. <laughs> You liked it. Uh, did you like it as much as uh, prior uh, MCU films or Spider Spider Man in particular? Where would you rank it? I, I would say the the film it, it had a real feel to me of the first Iron Man movie, and it's not like this is the first in the Spider Man series, but there are a lot of uh, similarities. And if you did not see Endgame, Whitney Houston spoils the shit out of the movie at the beginning. Whitney Houston. That's all I'm going to say. That's my review. <laughs> wow, okay. All right, thank you. All right. Uh we have a Smackdown to chat about. We have uh a lot of news to discuss actually, much more than we did on Monday night. Uh but my sincere thank you goes out to Waiting who is doing this with me uh much later than usual uh to allow me to go see this movie on Tuesday night. So Way, you are already the MVP of this show and I owe you. Oh my god. Not a problem. Not a problem. These are my hours, so it's fine. All right. Well, let's uh, let's quickly just go over what is coming up this week. If you are a frequent visitor at postwrestling.com, I don't know about you, Way, but I'm starting to look at these weekends, and it's like every weekend is turning into insanity. We have something almost every weekend day. Yeah, almost every every Saturday and Sunday. Not just something, like some things. Like these mm-hmm. are multiple event weekends. Like this one alone. Uh, I'm going to see the G1. I'm going to watch Slam Anniversary. I don't know what's going to happen with UFC 239, which is a pretty big one. I mean, John Jones is defending his title. Amanda Nunez is defending this title. Luke Rockhold's going up to light heavyweight. It's an awesome card. I hope I can find time to watch this. But then we go next weekend, dude, is a G1, I believe, on Saturday and Sunday. And I totally forgot that Extreme Rules is next weekend. And there's that Evolve card that's going to be on the WWE Network, which... Uh, we have delegated, we, we have farmed out, uh, Braden and Davey are going to be doing a show that night covering Evolve while you and I, oh dude, we're, we're doing Fight for the Fallen that night on Saturday. Yeah. So that is four major shows next weekend. Uh, UFC is not going to happen next weekend. I a hundred percent know that. That's perfect though. Uh, I'm, I, I, it makes sense. Uh, I'm glad Braden and Davey are up for doing that one. 
Yeah, so – but it just seems every weekend is turning into, like, what I just described. Yeah, yeah, but you know, the the I think the good thing is that a lot of the content seems really good. You know, that the fight for the Fallen show looks good. I mean, the G1, of course, it's all it's all good stuff. So I, I certainly don't expect, you know, your average wrestling fan to be watching every single match. So maybe that's where we come in just to kind of keep people up to date on what they might want to check out. You know, where it really hit me of like all these shows coming at me as I was watching Fighter Fest on the weekend. Uh, it was like three quarters into the show and I'm looking at the time and I was like, they've got to be doing some kind of ceremony in the ring. Like I'm sure Tony Khan has to come out and they're going to give like a speech about the money that's being donated for yeah. the, the gun violence. And then I was like, Oh Christ, that's the other show. Yes. I, I mixed <laughs> up uh, the initiative. Uh, Fighter fest was not raising money for anything. It's the next show. But that was where I was like, there, are, there are too many shows because I don't feel guilty that I mixed up these two. The summer is a, is a very busy summer. Yeah. It's a very busy summer. And it's a busy week at Post Wrestling. Every week will be busy this summer. Uh, so Wayne and I, uh, no double shot this week, and there will be no double shot until after the G1. The double shot will return. We already have our plan for when we come back. But much like uh, Bill Maher is on a hiatus, so is the double shot. But you are still going to get so much of our voices, you will not be wanting any more. So in, in its place, Wednesday night, it is our G1 primer. It is going to be WH Park, Wei Ting and myself going through the entire G1, a big preview. We'll break down everything. Uh, many different directions we will go on this one way. By the end of it, we'll know who the G1 winner is. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. But, you know, I, I always look at these primers that we do as sort of like an introduction of sorts for people who might not have been uh, so up to date with, you know, New Japan throughout the year. Uh, maybe just kind of a, a bit of a glimpse for those who have been following about maybe what what to expect through uh, the expertise of people like yourself in WH Park. So I'm looking forward to it personally. I'm not even making my picks until after listening uh, and doing this primer with you guys. Oh, wow. Wow. Have I'm you honored. made yours? I have not. No. Will you? Um, If I have time, maybe. Maybe I will. Thir- you, you know who You know who my pick is to win the contest? Who? Davy's girlfriend, who uh, Davy said that he got his girlfriend to make her picks, and she chose Kota Bushi to win all his matches because of uh, he's very handsome, and because Bad Luck Fale has a cool name. So Ibushi there you Fale go. Fale final, maybe uh, maybe oh, the same Ibushi. block. I think. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know how the entire uh, all of her picks went, but that those were deciding factors. So maybe maybe we might might have the successor to Gato uh, here by association in our network. I mean, if you're going by looks, I I don't know if Abushi could lose to anybody. Let's you think about what? B Block. Is there anybody in B Block who's or, or like an, the most yeah the most handsome, best looking Let's in B Block? So okay, we got John Mox. Let, let me. John okay. Moxley, Tetsuya Naito, Shingo Takagi, Jay White, Tai Chi. Oh, well, there you go. We got a Tai Chi Kota Ibushi final, is I think what she would say. Um, is Tai Chi the most handsome of all of them? He probably is. I, Hiroki Goto? Like, that, that's a, <laughs> that man could be, like, in ads. You know what I mean? Like, picture that guy in a polo shirt, like, for some cologne, maybe. We're getting into very subjective territory here, you know. Kota Ibushi, I would oh, say. I'm, I'm going. I'm going with Goto. Goto over Taichi. Okay. Send us your picks. Best looking members of the G1. It is is Ibushi like hands down the most handsome in the A block? I mean Tanahashi certainly. Sonata, I would say. You Okada. Know, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, A block uh, is way tougher. Even Kenta. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, and if maybe Folly, if you're into that. Uh, so. I would no, say no. A- that, that that's too stacked a block. Uh, Fall, I wouldn't be in my top five by far. We know how they separated the blocks this year. It's it's certainly Clearly. by looks. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, you know they've never recovered since uh, Devitt has left. Um, so beyond the G one primer, this might be our whole breakdown. You might get a whole show of this. Uh, on Thursday, we have the cafe hangout. Damien Abraham will join us live in studio. Uh, I cannot wait for this. Very excited. Uh, we will be taking your calls if you want to chat with Damien about any of the episodes from the past season. Maybe we'll come up with some ideas for season two where we can oh. send Damien. 
Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Come up with subjects for Damien to go to Viceland and pitch for season two. So that will be live Thursday, three o'clock Eastern as usual, double, double ice cap and espresso patrons can tune in live and also phone in to chat with myself, way and Damien up next. We'll also be coming out Thursday with Braden and Davey. And I will be joined by Cody Safdick for a UFC 239 preview. Uh, we are not going to have a UFC post show Saturday night because of the G1 that's going on. So we will have a preview and then return with the next UFC pay-per-view at the end of July. Friday, it is Ask Away, the mailbag edition. It looks like we have a ton of letters, questions that have come in. I know, like, like probably like a number of them just today for some reason. So I'm looking forward to that, um, as always, because usually because we don't have to do much preparation beforehand. This is the show where we just go and answer. And then we go into the weekend, which is like thousands of drone strikes that you're trying to uh, navigate. That's what the, that's what the weekend of wrestling is like, where we have two new editions of Cruel Summer coming your way on Saturday morning. WH will be joined by the great waiting to chat about the 2001 final between Keiji Muto and Yuji Nagata. And then 2002, Dylan Fox is on from the Eastern Larian po- Lariat podcast, making his second appearance on Cruel Summer, chatting about the Chono Takayama final from that year. Saturday night, it's the G1 Climax final, and way we will be live that night. Sorry, the premiere, not the final, but... Sorry. G1 Climax, night one in Dallas. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's right. We're, we're doing a live show for that one. Yes. We'll be live uh, after the show. So, again, Double Double, Ice Cap, Espresso patrons, you can watch, listen, and call in after the show. Why not? We'll take calls. And then it all wraps up Sunday. Nate Milton will be with me as we chat about Slammiversary. That is also taking place from Dallas, Texas. Everything's in Dallas this week. Except you and I. Except us, yeah. So that is the schedule. It is a busy one. Postwrestling.com. And where can people go away to get their picks in and join uh, the likes of uh, Davey Portman's girlfriend, yourself, and and millions of others out there? Postwrestling.com slash G1. You have until Thursday at midnight Eastern. Uh, And remember, if you're going to do the picks, remember to keep track of your own picks. I recommend taking screenshots of every uh, uh, sheet and and evening that you uh, fill out a card for. As well, uh, please write down a name and an email um, that you would recognize yourself with. So, uh, yeah, good luck. Good luck to all. Postwrestling.com is where you can go for that. And we haven't mentioned it, but uh, I'm going to continue to remind people. We are going to be live in Toronto, SummerSlam weekend. Wei Ting and I with our first live show ever in our home city. The John Candy Box Theater, Sunday, August the 11th, 1 p.m., for a live Q&A and meet and greet, you can go grab your tickets, postwrestling.com slash live. We have heard from uh, many of you that are attending, and we look forward to meeting many listeners, uh, and we'll have a fun time. It's going to be the weekend of all weekends. This is all preparation in July and early August for SummerSlam week, really. It's more than just the weekend. It's a great way to spend the hours before SummerSlam. Maybe even it instead is. of SummerSlam. Who knows? Yeah, it'll be shorter than SummerSlam. That's for sure. All right, let's get into some news items. Uh, This was probably a week where more people than usual were curious about how Raw's viewership would perform. We uh, threw out our guesstimates on Monday night, and they came in, and I would say it was a, I would say a positive number, up 10% over last week's figure. They did 2,496,000 viewers, uh, grew in the second hour, uh, up until up to 2,000, 2 million 678,000 viewers. Uh, this was their highest number in six weeks. And I guess, wait, do you attribute this solely to the curiosity of the show and the news involving Paul Heyman? Or do you think that the opening segment was something that drove people to tune in and see what was going on? Um, what do you attribute the increase to? Or was it a mix of a number of factors? I would say it would probably be a combination. Uh, but certainly the growth in the second hour, I think I look more towards the buzz coming out of that first segment uh, that that might have generated. Perhaps people saying, hey, did you see this on Raw? You got to check this out right now. Um, I, I I do feel like, you know, at least within our circles, perhaps the announcement of Heyman uh, and, and Bischoff coming in might have made made for, for a bit of a difference. I also think it, it'll be really interesting to see if SmackDown managed to benefit from uh, any of that buzz as well. 
Yeah, uh, they did have a drop in the third hour of 12.7%. Uh, I think part of that as well was the fact that the second hour was up so much that you had a unusually high second hour and coupled with the usual drop you get in the third hour. And I, I, I don't know how you really turn that around. Like the third hour, it's a, it's a killer, I think, regardless. And it's just simply trying to mitigate the loss you can have. And for three weeks in a row now, the formula has been to put on uh, a hot match at the end, or at least promise a hot match at the end of the show. And three minutes of a hot match. Well, that's the problem. Are people going to be too, uh, catching up to that fact that even if we're promising you a Ricochet AJ Styles match, uh, given the format, are you really going to be getting that match? Or are you going to be getting something that approximates uh, two segments just forced together to break up what could be a strong 12 minutes and it's turned into a two and three minute match. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was also curious that they didn't announce that match until the body of the show. Unlike uh, the first time that they did it. Uh, So some other news, uh, there was quite a bit of it on, uh, on Monday or on Tuesday, rather Uh, we can start off with uh, fans in Glasgow, Scotland, which got a shout out on SmackDown tonight by Nikki cross. They, sent out a a message, uh, a mailer to anyone that had bought tickets for the live Raw that was going to be happening November the 11th in Glasgow, Scotland, announcing that if you have bought tickets to this show, it will no longer be a televised event. They're changing it into a house show, but the same Raw talent that was announced will be on this show. So in theory, it's not like they're going to be taping Raw elsewhere because all the Raw talent that's been announced is on this Monday night show in Scotland. So I don't know what they're doing with the schedule. Um, They've canceled several of the European dates in November, and maybe this has to do with uh, trying to figure out the next Saudi Arabia show that's going to be very problematic to do on a Friday that they've done traditionally when you've got SmackDown on Fridays now. But it seems like these uh, the European audience is kind of getting the short end of this or whatever they're trying to work out at the moment logistically. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of a decision that I think is, is filled with a bit of mystery. Um, until I certainly, I would imagine it, it probably has something to do with the Saudi Arabia thing, but why the need to take TV out, but keep the talent in is I can't really figure that out. It's not like they're canceling the show outright. They're, doing a live event and they are offering refunds to those that bought tickets. But you know, for a place it's one thing if this were to happen in a domestic market, but somewhere like Glasgow that, I mean, they come once a year and to do TV there, that's very rare. So I can see fans being really disappointed when you've promoted this. I mean, could it have something to do with the fact that, you know, in the past now they get to do TV on Monday and Tuesday uh, in a foreign market, if they choose to do TV there, but now, with Friday and then the big gap over the weekend, does it not make much sense to keep a crew around for those extra few days? Well, yeah, that's that to me is what I was thinking, that if they are taping in the U.S. on Friday, mm-hmm. maybe they're just going to tape Raw on the Saturday or something and air Monday night and not have the crew fly overseas. Yet the same advertised talent will be appearing at that house show. Well, you could if you would be able to do something like you tape Raw on Saturday mm-hmm. after SmackDown, and then the crew flies over to do Raw to do the to do the tour, including that Monday night house show. Right, right. But I guess you save on perhaps production costs. Yeah, sending your whole production crew over to do the Monday show if the Friday SmackDown, for instance, is still in the U.S. or wherever that location is for the Friday before. Yeah, yeah. We'll 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 see. I'm sure this will all unfold itself. Uh, Let's go through uh, some other news and notes here. Uh, AAA had a press conference today announcing their whole card for Triple Mania. That's August the 3rd. Uh, It's headlined by uh, Blue Demon Jr. and Dr. Wagner Jr. in a mask versus hair match. They're doing a rematch from Fighter Fest with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega against Pentagon Jr., Ray Phoenix, and Laredo Kid. And the real main event, Cody Rhodes, Psycho Clown, and Kane Velasquez versus... Tejano Jr., Tarus, and TBA, with a strong suspicion that it's going to end up being Killer Cross in that spot. Way, if I had told you in 2010 <laughs> that Cody Rhodes, the guy wearing the face mask on SmackDown, 
would be teaming with Cain Velasquez on a triple mania card in uh, Mexico City. You would have thought I was nuts. Unimaginable. Completely. Um, this is going to be the most bizarre match ever. Well, the only thing better is if TBA ended up be- ended up being another uh, UFC competitor. Wouldn't that be crazy? But um, yeah, it's not going to be Brock. No, um, I'm very curious to, about this one. You know, I don't know if I'll be watching it live, but I'll, uh, certainly after the fact, I'm really curious to see how Cain Velasquez does. Yeah, it's going to be certainly something to watch. Um, not someone you had pegged for pro wrestling, but has shown an interest in it and. Noteworthy that he's allowed to do this. Yeah. As a as a UFC fighter. So uh, those are the top matches for uh, Triple Mania. And also worth noting the fact, have you noticed this, that Cody is now going as Cody Rhodes? He was announced as Cody Rhodes by Justin Roberts at Fighter Fest. Uh, today's show, he was uh, on the poster. He was listed as Cody Rhodes for Triple Mania. It seems like he's like slowly reintroducing the Rhodes name. I actually didn't notice. No, I mean, I've gotten so used to Cody now, um, it it almost doesn't really make a difference. Yeah, I mean, he has mentioned it before that he can use it, so he he appears to be using it now. Yeah, I'm curious to hear maybe the reason why he's decided now to do it. Perhaps, you know, doing a lot more media as a face of AEW, it it might be a little awkward to not have a last name. Like, let's say if you're you're talking to, to people who know nothing about pro wrestling. Cody is a little bit strange. Um, Also, I'm sure having, you know, I know he he doesn't want to, you know, make his name based off of uh, being the son of Dusty Rhodes, but certainly it can't hurt. Uh, We do have a a quick bio on Jacques Rougeau Sr., who passed away on Monday. He was 89 years old. He was the father of uh, Jacques Raymond and Armand Rougeau. Uh, Pat Laprade wrote up this uh, this bio and sent it to us. So that is up on the main page if you want to go check that out. Uh, someone, of course, very famous wrestling family here in Canada. And he was, uh, what, what, I'll say one of the patriarchs because his brother, Johnny Rougeau, was uh, an enormous star in not just Montreal, but went to many, many places. And Johnny Rougeau was the big, big star. Uh, and Jacques Sr. kind of had... Uh, his ins and outs with pro wrestling. Like he was in it, then he was out of it, then he'd come back. Um, But anyway, passing away on Monday at the age of 89. And we also got way on Monday, the apology from Seth Rollins, who wrote, after a few days to sit on it, I'd like to apologize to Will Ospreay for the tweet I sent his way about comparing bank accounts. It was dumb of me and not in line with my values. The moment I pressed the send button, I knew it was trash but I'm too stubborn for my own good. I stand firm in my sentiments that WWE is the best pro wrestling on the planet and that I'm the best of the best doing it right now. After a hell of a week of travel, our crew didn't waver for a second. Top-level humans busting their asses for the love of the game. I couldn't be more proud to be a champion with this company and represent WWE and the entire industry in the way it deserves. No more garbage tweets. I can and will be better. I mean, a nice conclusion, I would say, to what seemed like a story that ultimately ended with, I think, Seth Rollins really harming his reputation. But, you know, I thought he he turned heel and then he back, turned back to babyface with a tweet like this. And um, it takes, you know, a great deal of, I think, um, um, confidence and also humility in order to publicly apologize for saying something that, you know, everybody thought was pretty stupid. So I thought... It was a very nice apology, and Will Osprey accepted it. Kumbaya. It was a, it was a nice ending to their their week of tweets, which really kind of died after you know bigger news kind of surfaced. But I'm sure he had quite a lengthy week of of mentions, and I I don't know. But anyway, I I thought uh, a nice gesture on his part to kind of acknowledge that. He kind of put in a dick comment there that I think soured everyone from even those that were defending him, that the guy's just going out defending his company and then went to yeah, probably an unfair comparison point. And at the end of the day, it was two guys that I think have a large amount of respect for each other and pride in their companies. Yeah. That's it. Um, did you have a chance to listen to the Kevin Owens interview? And do you want to chat about that now, or would you want to wait till later? I haven't listened to the whole podcast yet, but I listened to a good chunk of it, so it's it's up to you. Um, well, we don't have to spend too much time on it. I just thought it was a really interesting discussion about a guy that I've always found to be very forthright in his 
honest assessment of himself and his position in his career. And when he was the first subject on 365, and I thought he was a great subject because he is not he is not painting a facade. He will put everything out there. And he even brought up in this interview the fact that kind of 365 kind of painted a happier picture than it was for him. Like this was and still is uh, what he classifies like a rough patch of his career ever since the WrestleMania match with Chris Jericho that Vince McMahon hated. And Kevin Owens has mentioned like his first two years on the main roster, he overachieved beyond what anyone thought. And since 2017, it's been really hard for him to find his place in this company and somewhat decode how things work here and where his placement is because he acknowledges the fact I'm all over the show. I'm clearly someone valued, but I'm not the guy. I'm not a, I'm not a top priority. I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but it's someone who's just, he never at one instance sounded upset with the company. It was just, what am I doing wrong? And I can't figure out how to get myself to where I want to be. And what that even means, because he just goes over never being happy in his career, not enjoying when he was universal champion because he was constantly thinking about the next week. And I mean, it was just to me a very revealing discussion about the insecurities that I'm sure many performers have, not just in that company, in wrestling as a whole, that it's a very difficult industry to figure out with the politics involved and so many other factors. And in WWE, it's a pressure cooker and um, a- a- any of your thoughts just in, t- well, in terms of what you did here and, and the tone. I mean, on that note, like I, I feel like a lot of, a lot of what he, 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 he said on the podcast that he's going through is not just something that's probably shared by other wrestlers, but anybody who considers themselves a perfectionist and maybe is having trouble, you know, uh, achieving the level of success that uh, they, they want to ultimately have. The problem with Kevin Owens, though, is that he's in an industry and in a company where I don't know if your performance necessarily equates to um, you getting that promotion and getting that spot, especially not when it's it's a it's a company that, you know, operates on the whims of one man. And for if for whatever reason, that man, you know, smells like a bad stench on you one day and decides that you're not the guy to to be in this position, then that's just the, the decision, and it's nothing you can really do. I don't know if Kevin Owens like um, completely understands that, or maybe he's trying to understand that. From the sounds of it, it sounds like he's he's trying to be comfortable um, with with what he has, and you know, not necessarily uh, resting on it, but not completely mentally um, stressing out over it. And it's something he also mentioned in this, in this podcast, how, you know, when he got injured, he was excited. I mean, not necessarily excited, but he was looking forward to not only healing his injury, but, but healing his mind, taking time off so that, um, you know, uh, the stresses of like the constant grind of that he was on for, for so, those, those many years, um, he could finally kind of take some rest with. I, I think it's, you know, on a bigger scale it's um i love that he's so open and honest about his thoughts because i think it's another um you know indicator that mental health is is that important you know even if you're not somebody who's clinically diagnosed with anything if you're just a, a somebody who's just incredibly driven and passionate about the field that you're you're working in um it's important to take that time off um in any field so i i hope he he manages to find um that that comfort somewhere yeah, um, th- th- uh, there were several like really insightful things from him in this. Uh, he reveals when he's on the road, he travels by himself. Uh, he noted not being where he wants to be. And I think that's, it's kind of interesting to look at that if you were, let's just throw out a name just for, for whatever reason. Like it's not as though he's Chad Gable, for instance, who's just so clearly not a priority. Like they just, For whatever reason, he's not figured into big plans on the show. Owens, on the other hand, Owens is not, I guess, you know, a super push guy. But he is, like, he has Vince McMahon just tear apart this match with Chris Jericho. And six months later, Owens is involved in one of the most physical angles with Vince McMahon imaginable. So it's like you're on cloud nine for one instance, and yet 
completely on his bad side for another. And it's kind of mirrors just where he is. Like there's certain weeks where it feels like, oh, they're getting behind Kevin Owens. And he always feels like he's that one program away from being a top guy that he has many of the attributes that make up someone that could be in that top spot. And then suddenly he's brought back down to earth. And it's, I think he's someone more, more than most that you see that, that kind of teasing with and then brought back. I think for a long time, Dolph Ziggler was that person. And I think Kevin Owens now finds himself in that spot that Dolph Ziggler had been in for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I don't know for Kevin Owens what the solution is. I mean, it's, you know, like very few are kind of chosen to be the face of a company. I don't know if that's his ultimate goal, um, but I, I just, uh, I, I mean, it sounds like his goal is to simply be like in a main event and be champion again, um, which I have confidence that if he stays in that company long enough and if he stays healthy, he'll get there again. Will he ever be, be you know, John Cena or Roman Reigns or even, you know, um, I don't know, Randy Orton? I I don't know. I'm not sure. But um I, I also hope he doesn't completely base his self worth on whether or not he achieves that goal. Yeah. He also talked about uh kind of like this generation of people and asked about if people are too sensitive these days towards things, and he actually has the opposite view, believing that today, you know, in this you know, quote unquote PC culture, it's more in line with how we should be like there was a time he said he would come up in the industry and hear terms that were deplorable and he's glad that today that stuff like that wouldn't fly and he even admits himself that when he was young you know in it sounded like in a wrestling context like he used terms that he's very ashamed of and understands he now is 35 and can reflect on this but even when he was 20 he should have known better and uh, I, th I thought that was an interesting insight as well mm -hmm. Um, to me, to just, I mean, that, that's a very mature way of thinking about it. And it's something that I'm sure like a lot of us might, might've, you know, con thought about and considered. And I think, you know, I saw somebody on Reddit, this actually, this quote got a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, spread around was spread around quite a bit. And somebody, a top comment on Reddit stated how, you know, because of the internet we're actually brought closer together than ever before. So it's, because we now get to hear the the opinions of uh, people who traditionally might not have had much say in in matters that you know is part of the reason why we should be be more respectful of everybody. Yeah, I, I think that that's I, th I think that's something to take into account when you you hear you know something that is brought brought to light from someone's past and. Not to say you just necessarily get a pass because it was years ago, but also you, you hopefully judge it by the person and is this someone that has honestly learned from this. And it seems like Kevin Owens not getting into direct examples is someone that does look at parts of his past that he regrets. And um, I think that that is something to take into account with people too, that it's it's very easy to just simply look – take take things from years past and extrapolate that this is a terrible person. And I think it's it's much more nuanced than that. I think if you combed anybody's personal history of every single thing that they might have said throughout their entire lifetime, it's not going to take very long before you find something that any of us have said that we might have regretted in the future. So um, I, I certainly would, would give that same level of, uh, I guess, I don't know, leeway to, to Kevin Owens. And the the final thing he talked about was WrestleMania this year and just how uh, frustrating it was to be left off of WrestleMania, so much so that he had gone to um, New York or New Jersey, uh, wherever he was staying, and he had an access session on Monday. And rather than stay there in, in the city, uh, he ended up flying himself home on Sunday just to spend with his family because he didn't want to be there and then flew back for the access session on Monday and afterwards realized he was left off WrestleMania and, you know, the world didn't end. And he was actually, you know, it seemed, I wouldn't say like, okay with it, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world. The fact that he was off it, he lived through it and it's, he just moved on after it. But I'm, I'm certain that he will maybe uh, one day talk more at length about that, but certainly indicating like it was a, it was a difficult weekend for him. 
to be there. Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, it requires that level of drive in order to like succeed in this business. But man, I hear something like that, and I just, I, I feel like it's almost, I feel like it would be such so miserable to like, I don't know, um, uh, worry that much over something like. Eh, anyway, it's it's not for me to to say. Yeah, no, I I think that it's I I would really recommend this interview um to get some insight into someone that. Ah, it's obvious. Like it's it's something that he's. It, it's so often like when we watch these WWE specials that we review. It's if there is a problem or a conflict that's introduced, it's it's solved at the end. It's a happy ending. It sends the viewer home that this person has overcome this. And uh, life is not always that easy. It, where in forty five minutes uh, a problem is solved, and Kevin Owens is pretty adamant that you know this is something he's still. Like he struggles with, like to find happiness and his frustrations at work. He was bringing home with him to his family, and he had to he had to be able to stop that and realizing that was not fair to his family. And it's even as he is searching for this this happiness career wise, he acknowledges that when I was Universal Champion and when I was doing all the stuff with Jericho, I was not able to enjoy any of that. So I, I just thought there are probably a lot of guys and women who would probably introduce a portion of their insecurities and not to the extent that I thought Owens did in this interview. I thought it was just a very revealing look and, and it doesn't have like an, uh, uh, a happy solution at the end of it, a happy ending to uh, his struggles. They're ongoing. And that's how many people, it's, it's not something that you just snap your fingers and move on from. And I think Lillian Garcia actually does a great job as well. I mean, she almost kind of, it almost sounded like she was, she was his shrink. For yeah, a, a portion of this, but you know, really, she just seems to be a great listener and and a very attentive uh, conversationalist. All right, from there, we go into SmackDown Live, a show that was largely built around Kevin Owens uh, from the AT and T Center in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, th- this felt very different from Raw. Um, many. I mean, th- I think it depends on how you look at Raw. Um, certainly there were parts of it that felt different, but you know, if you talk to some people, I feel like many parts of raw felt similar, felt the same. And I would say this was an episode of SmackDown that maybe felt more like the previous episodes of SmackDown. Right. Um, from, from reports, Eric Bischoff was scheduled to be at this show, although it sounds like his first official show where he is in uh, his role Uh, is probably going to be in about two weeks' time. So I don't know if people were watching this with the same curiosity as Heyman, who is already in the creative process and and looking for indications on Raw Monday night of where you could find Paul Heyman's fingerprints. I mean, I I feel like so much of that depends on how far that news might have traveled. You know, how many people are reading, like, Dave's report or or on the internet or, 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 you know, know that Bischoff might not be a part of this as much as Haven was a part of Monday. I don't know. Uh, the show started off with a recap of the Braun Strowman, Bobby Lashley angle, and we will hear from Bobby Lashley tonight. Kevin Owens comes out for the KO show, and his guests are Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre. As Greg Hamilton does the introduction, they recap the Undertaker's appearance on Raw. Uh, this is like a little thing, but do you remember where Shane... Uh, where his rivalry with Roman Reigns began. What caused it? Um, trying to think. Well, it was certainly after the Miz, and then um, I remember don't, what I don't. Do you remember what Roman Reigns did? He delivered a Superman oh, yeah. punch to Vince McMahon. Yes, that has been the source of Shane's desire to destroy this man. And here he is hanging out with Kevin Owens, a man that headbutted his father. Well, didn't like Owens actually help him one week? Like I feel like they Shane? even joked about this. Yeah, they yeah they did they did do that. So it's it's in the past, I guess. I guess there there is a um, <laughs> there, there there's a there's a length to how long grudges last, but uh, that's a little thing that I, I feel is something that sh- should be addressed. I think that in just a larger sense when it comes to uh, major angles. I mean, we're talking about Shane and the Undertaker now from even longer before that point. I think some things they retain in their memory and some things they just seem to forget. And maybe this headbutt was one of those things they forgot. 
They showed The Undertaker on Raw. Shane mentions that their match is now going to be no holds barred at Extreme Rules. Drew cuts a promo about laying a vicious assault on Roman and The Undertaker, something that Shane calls spooky, what Drew has said. And then Owens replays Shane and Drew retreating from the ring when The Undertaker came out, and Owens defends them, saying, that's just a natural reaction when you hear his music, but knows they weren't really scared. So then Shane browbeats Owens and tells him to go back and read the cards and do your job. And Owens goes back to reading and then brings up Shane losing to The Undertaker at Hell in a Cell, and Drew shuts down the interview. For whatever reason, this prompts Dolph Ziggler to come out. I don't know what he was going to do, but Owens just starts mocking Dolph and his promos from the past two months and pretty much just makes fun of Dolph's entire WWE run. Uh, Dolph responds saying Owens looks like he could enter a hot dog eating contest. And Owens said, well, I'd win that, which is better than you do in your wrestling matches. And they start arguing over who should have the next title shot. Shane says neither of them should get the next title shot and ends up pairing them together as a tag team to take on heavy machinery tonight. And the winners will be added to the previously announced tag title match involving Daniel Bryan and Rowan against the New Day. And then we had this clumsy ending to this segment where Shane's music started. It cut. And then Owens and Ziggler are left there, and Owens has to call for his music to be played to end the segment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was certainly a bit of a clunky segment, and in contrast to the start of Monday's Raw, um, felt just, I would say... Two different disasters, one planned and (laughs) one impromptu. This, to me, felt very much like every bit the the same typical opening we see each week on WWE TV. It's a 10-minute talking segment, and by the end of it... Two guys who can't get along are going to be put into a tag team for a chance at some type of uh, title opportunity. It it was relatively um, uninspired. And I would say Kevin Owens here was pretty much like portrayed as a baby face on this show. Um, You know, having a very strong opposing voice to Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre um, going as far as to show footage of Shane McMahon and losing or going to, I don't know, talking about... uh, their attacks. Did he show the Hell in a Cell footage? I forget. They didn't show the Hell in a Cell yeah. footage. It was just brought up. Bringing it up, at least. Um, I feel like it's like a, a turn simply for the sake of convenience. And uh, wait, wait, wait. You did, did you hear that part of the podcast? Owens wants to challenge himself and be a babyface, and Lillian instructed him to say it and put it out into the universe, and then maybe he'll become a babyface, and it worked. So I guess that's where the babyface turn took place on Lil- yes. Lillian, Lillian Garcia's podcast. Yep, he um, put it out into the universe. I guess my other heard. question is, didn't Sammy and KO already beat the New Day at Stomping Grounds? Yes. So why are the New Day getting a title shot, and why does Owens have to earn the shot again? What you just explained with Shane and Kevin Owens, like you're not supposed to remember that far back. That's the timeline, two weeks. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, Sammy Zayn was MIA this week. He wasn't on either show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it it was very confusing when I saw that the New Day were announced as the number one contenders for the Extreme Rules match and then putting this together. Um, I think Owens tried to keep this together at the end, but it was it just it just seemed like people on different pages. And Mm -hmm. I understood where they were going for, but it was quite the maneuvering you had to do to get to this tag announcement and getting Ziggler inserted into all of this. Yeah. Kayla was with Brian and Rowan for their reaction. And Brian said that they are forced to accept Shane's bad decisions. And now they, it's more mathematically difficult for them to retain the tag titles with three teams in the match as opposed to two and asks Kayla about her math skills. Then after the break, Kayla spoke to Xavier Woods and Big E in the back. And they mentioned they don't have to be pinned or submitted to lose this match. And Big E quotes Big E... (laughs) Quotes Biggie, who he notes has no relation to him, that they will kick in the door. And then we went right into New Day's intro. I always love a notorious B.I.G. reference. Brian versus Biggie. Early on, Biggie did his abdominal stretch, spanking Brian. And then we went to a commercial break. And this was one of the two matches where... uh, 
those on the USA network got to watch it and we were shut out at the miss yeah. miss the, this uh this action during the break. I noticed for the first time that they were trying uh playing around with a new camera angle here. It was like a handheld camera right in the middle of the ring, right in front of the hard camera. In fact, one of the hard camera shots that they cut to had this like cameraman standing standing right in front of the ring. And then they gave it up after the break, so I don't know if it was just part of the experimentation or or something. I, I, w- I would say so. They've been doing stuff on 205 Live as well, testing stuff out. Right. Um, Brian attacked Biggie's previously injured knee that he was out of action for with a sliding drop kick, yes kicks, then Biggie ducks belly to belly and a splash for a two count. He then flew through the ropes to the floor, stopped a suicide dive from Brian, and then Rowan got involved, sending Big- Biggie into the post, knocked down Woods, and threw E. It- Threw E into the ring where Brian hit the flying knee and Daniel Bryan pins Big E. So hell of a hell of a build up here for these challenges going into their big tag title opportunity. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to make sense. I I don't know at this point. Like, if you're going back and trying to count all these wins and losses, I just I don't know how, how much of a clear picture you're you're really going to have. I, I don't know how they decide who wins and who or who loses. Perhaps they just feel like Brian's lost a lot lately and he needs a win. I, I don't know the rhyme or reason, to be honest. Yeah, so, I mean, they did beat Brian and Rowan in a non-title match last week. So that is their, I guess, claim to the title match. This coming after oh, okay. the loss to Owens and Zayn at the pay-per-view. Um, so that is how we have arrived at all of this. Okay, makes perfect sense. I wouldn't say perfect sense, but that is the rationale. Kayla interviewed R-Truth. He refuses to throw to the recap, but Kayla insists that they show him losing the title to Drake Maverick on Raw. He says he's heard that Drake Maverick and Renee are here in San Antonio, and he's coming for them. He wants his baby back. Uh, But this was never revisited. I thought we were maybe going to get uh, R-Truth going to search for them in San Antonio, but we did not. At least not on this show. Maybe they will pop up on YouTube. They're already on the air in the airport, and in fact, Drake Maverick like posted some really funny videos today of of him and his wife at the airport with the title that I I'm surprised they didn't air on SmackDown because quite frankly, it was a lot better than this interview with our truth, and it was kind of as much as we got today for the 24 seven title. Alexa Bliss with, was with Nikki Cross and said she is going to have Nikki host the Moment of Bliss segment tonight and. Cross got all nervous. Bliss knows that she is socially awkward, but she's kicking her out of the nest and she will fly. And then Cross gets excited about getting to host the moment of bliss. Yeah. So she came out. She said she loves Alexa Bliss. And I was waiting for her to dub this way. The cross examination. Ooh. There's so much you can do with that name. The crossword puzzle. Um, yeah. Cross. The cr- Criss Cross? Uh, yeah. The Criss Cross. <laughs> she notes that she is from Glasgow, Scotland, and therefore has an accent, so she's going to talk slowly so that she can be the best host she can be and introduce Bailey. What What do you make of that? That line? I mean, because it was not done as a heel line at all. In fact, no, I, I think- it was it was done like I am trying to acclimate to you. <laughs> My American viewers. It was almost like she was apologizing for her thick accent. And, yeah. Um, this wouldn't have played well if she was like Japanese, I feel. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not. You imagine I'm not someone sure. saying, I'm from Japan, so I'm going to talk slow because I know you can't understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how, how, how that would sound. But I, I find it interesting. And I think maybe I, I'm trying to wonder why. Maybe they, they felt the need for her to, to say this. For, I mean... To be quite honest, she does have like a very thick accent that maybe they anticipated people would have jumped on had she not, um, I guess, called it out herself beforehand, perhaps. I was waiting for her to speak very, very slowly and explain no raw TV coming to Glasgow house show only. (laughs) Bailey comes out and she's so surprised Alexa would give her some of the spotlight and Cross defends Alexa, says she is not doing her bidding for her, and asks why Bailey called Alexa a liar. And Bailey's response, because ding dong, she is a liar. Yep. Ding dong. 
Bailey then notes that Nikki beat her last week and beat Carmella last night. Why am I facing Alexa at Extreme Rules? Nikki goes, I don't know. The New Day are getting a tag title shot. Cross doesn't know, but she asks, why am I not facing you right now? And Bailey takes this as a challenge. Duh. Ding dong. And we have a match. Bailey and Nikki Cross, non-title. Yeah. Um. How did Nikki do? Um, um, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> I guess it was fine. I'll, I'll say, like, I think they've been successful at creating Nikki Cross uh, into, I would say, a, a credible challenger who I think people feel a bit of sympathy for because she's clearly being manipulated by Alexa Bliss. I, I can't really understand maybe the booking coming out of this match, though. It was a, uh, it was puzzling. Uh, I will give you that. Uh, Bailey and Nikki Saxton says that typically in sports entertainment, you beat the champion and you get a title shot. Not in this company. No. Nikki cross hit a cross body for a two count fired up on Bailey went for a tornado DDT. It was blocked and Bailey hit the Bailey to belly and pinned her clean in three minutes and eight seconds. Yeah. So this is what, what really confused me because they build Nikki cross all the way up to make us think that she's deserving of a title shot. And then they put her in this non-title match and have Bailey beat her. So now, as a viewer, I'm no longer interested in seeing Nikki get a title shot. After all, um, I'm not it's sure. Kind of just took the the whole rug out from underneath this story that they had been building. It's like we'll see what they do to follow up on this, but it just felt like okay, now Nikki has no claim to be in this match, and it just kind of o- over overwrote what they yeah. did up until this point. It was. Yeah. Strange. I mean, I certainly don't need to know and be. I I shouldn't. I shouldn't want be able to predict every single you know piece of the story and and know where they're going. So I'm still keeping an open mind to this. Um, but I have to say, like, I feel a lot of what they've already done has been a little bit convoluted, including all the the two matches that they had in in within the span of like three minutes on on Monday. Everybody ultimately taking losses here. I'm talking Alexa lost. On Monday, Carmella lost on Monday, and now Nikki, the who beat them all, lost as well. So, I don't know. Somebody's going to win eventually, I guess. At the very least, I thought Alexa would get involved and would screw up and cost Nikki the match. But there was no Alexa at all in this. Yeah, I don't know. We had a promo, uh, a tape promo outdoors with Ali, saying the chase is real. The chase for the title to bring power, money, and fame that all these people are going after. He doesn't want that. He wants to bring change to millions of minds that have been forced to believe a lie that where they are from and what their name is defines them. And one day, an announcer will have to say his name, and there will be posters with his face on it and a story just like yours. He says, let the chase continue. The lies be exposed let the change begin. It's a way yeah. one day he is going to be able to be himself and announced as your new WWE champion, Mustafa Ali. <laughs> so until then, he can't? Is that what you took from this? Yeah. I mean, this is the guy who, like, literally, like, his name, half of it was taken away from him. Yeah. I, I'm not so, I, I wonder if that was a comment on that or... I, I would think not, maybe, but um, I don't. I don't know. But I love the promo. I absolutely loved it. I think Mustafa, I, I really like the the style and yeah. looking for like these are so much better than Kayla's well, latest interview. And that's not a knock on Kayla, but just that style. Yeah, where he just like goes out there and cuts a promo because Mustafa Ali or Ali, whatever you want to call him, he really is like. He's so gifted because he comes across like a very inspirational speaker. And I love the story. Like his is a story that caters to an incredibly misrepresented market in pro wrestling. And in his case, that's Muslims. And by extension, though, I would say this story, I think, is resonates to all minorities. I think um, it was really nice that this week they got back to the style of promo like he's been doing in the past. I found this far more impactful than... You know, the videos that, that, that had him walking around seeing various people in poor circumstances, I think admittedly that was rather cheesy and corny. 
So I'm glad they just kind of got back to basics. This is all we need. We need Ali. We need an interesting background. And we need a camera and a microphone to capture these incredibly intense, excellent promos. And I love that Vince McMahon continues to not only give this man airtime, but allows them to these promos to look like a specific style onto their own. They're filmed by a, a Chicago wrestler and videographer by the name of Craig Mitchell, who's been doing all of these for Ali. And um, these have been great. It's it's specific to him. Clearly, he's very comfortable cutting this style of promo. And I think they're, to me at least, they're doing wonders for him. I hope they're able to capitalize on it by giving him a storyline that, you know, hits on everything he talked about. Being somebody who wants to inspire change and to represent, uh, you know, and to inspire people who might look like him that they're not being defined by their name or where they come from. I think if you did this right with Ali, he could be the guy to beat Kofi Kingston. Like they have the backstory and it doesn't have to be either going heel to do this. And I wouldn't do that. But with Kofi getting yep. Ali's spot and they both have very similar uh, fan bases and what they represent, um, I think you could do something really great with that as a title program at some point. I think their stories are so similar that I wonder if, you know, putting them together might harm the other in some way. I I almost see it more as like the way Kofi might have like it's kind of like doing the same Kofi story, but perhaps, you know, at some other time. I feel like Kofi would have to end his reign before you, you get to Ali, if you ever get to Ali. Sarah Schreiber interviewed Heavy Machinery. Otis shaked. They mentioned Owens and Ziggler have 18 combined titles, but they have never won titles as a team. And Schreiber says, did you come up with that number off the top of your head? And they said, no, we scout our opponents and they will implode. Um, did you miss the Samoa Joe Kofi? I completely missed the Samoa oh. Joe Kofi bit. Yes, we had that in between all of this. Kayla's in the ring and brings out Kofi, followed by Samoa Joe for a face-to-face. -face. Joe says that they're going to be discussing some sensitive subjects and advise Kayla to leave to eliminate collateral damage. Mm -hmm. Were they going to, like, pull knives on each other? Um, well, this was going to get violent. Knife edge chops, maybe. Perhaps. <laughs> nice. Uh, Joe says, that's an example of generosity and benevolence. And some of us hustle with fear and some of us hustle with charisma. And he knows that Kofi is using the people just like him and he's no better. And he wouldn't be surprised if years from now, Xavier Woods is still out here as his hype man and Big E can be his butler. Kingston responds, I won this title by myself at WrestleMania. I beat Kevin Owens. I beat Dolph Ziggler. But what has Joe done by himself other than lose the United States title to Ricochet? What happened to the old Samoa Joe who took on all comers? Now he sneaks around and attacks people while playing hide and seek. Joe, let me tell you something. Your ass is too big to be playing hide and seek. And Joe then accuses Kofi of using his children to peddle his t-shirts. Kofi can see through Joe's jealousy. Jealous Joe, he gets the audience to chant. He's jealous because Joe will never have a moment like him at WrestleMania to share with his children. And Joe says that I will offer my hand to you. And if you shake my hand as the man that has put you to sleep the last two weeks, and who you know it will be the next champion, if you shake my hand, acknowledging that, I won't hurt your friends before Extreme Rules. They can all be safe, but it's up to your pride, Kofi. And Kofi looks at the hand, and he puts out his right hand, but before he goes to shake his hand, he gives a, a very hidden middle finger as the camera's behind Joe, and we actually cut away because of just the... The sheer visual of a middle finger being displayed at this hour on television. And then Kofi hits him with a trouble in paradise. This was an awesome, awesome segment. It was so great. 
it was so great uh punctuated by the finger which i took to be sort of like the holy shit moment of this this edition of smackdown i mean whereas you know on it's kind of interesting because like on raw they went with not censoring holy shit to kind of make you take notice and here they decided to censor something that really didn't need to be censored but on the exact same network at a later time <laughs> yeah uh but they decided to censor it but ultimately the impact the the effect is that it got your attention it made you feel like maybe this was something that you weren't supposed to see i thought the segment was great you know like where do we start like samoa joe as usual perhaps the best heel promo in the business right now you know, I feel like I've said that about MJF, but like, I think MJF is more of a comedy heel, whereas Joe is a legitimately scary man. Like the man, the kind that'll make you scared for your wife and kids, that type of heel. I thought he was so good here. Uh, but Kofi, all of his retorts, I thought were very well written. He took on Joe's kind of usual game of threats and he broke it down via logic. You are jealous that you'll never have these moments like I have to show to your kids. I thought he out psychologically maneuvered the psychological maneuverer. Um, to me, the icing on the cake, though, was that middle finger. And, you know, I think we often compare like Kofi's run to Brett's as like, you know, baby face champs who really don't step down from challenges and just like, con like conduct them themselves with a great deal of respect. But I think where they differ is that Brett like had no street cred. He didn't know how to defend himself in situations against guys with edge like Austin or DX without looking kind of old and kind of uncool. But Kofi Kingston doesn't have that problem. Not only, you know, does he carry that belt with pride and, and a great deal of respect, but when it's time to talk trash, he knows how to talk trash. So I love the segment. I think this was exactly what face to face segments should be uh, a, an excellent balance promo battle between two very great guys that cut promos well worth watching if you haven't seen it yeah the only thing that would have made this better would be kofi saying i beat daniel bryan for the title at wrestlemania and you were in a 60 second match so let's compare bank accounts after wrestlemania whoa damn this was great it was just a great segment to build up a match that you wanted to see at the end of it which is the goal of a segment like this you want to see this match mm -hmm. so this is great. I really hope this is Kofi's summer program. I hope this is not one and done at Extreme Rules. I mean, beyond that, I hope this is like the type of Co Kofi Kingston characters characterization we continue to get. You know, somebody who's just not afraid to like, you know, clown other people um, when the t when the time arrives for it. Yes. Sarah Schreiber uh, did the interview with Heavy Machinery, and then we got the big world exclusive interview with Bobby Lashley. And who is able to get the exclusive Twitter? His cell phone tracked down this interview. Bobby said Braun got what he deserved. He was driven off the stage into an unsafe area, and he could have been electrocuted or something worse. Braun got the worst of it, as he should. And next time I see that son of a bitch... I'm not sending him to the hospital. I'm sending him to the morgue. You see, I'm going to murder him. I'm going to kill Braun Strowman. Everything they've done with this angle, I mean, stemming from Monday, I thought was handled really well, including like starting the show off the top here, reminding us all that it occurred and like it was being treated as this incredibly serious, like company affecting thing. I was not a fan of this selfie promo from Bobby Lashley. This but, was not the, 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 you know how I talked about like my issue with like the, the, the young bucks doing like their thing on the pre-show to me, this was like, this was not a Twitter thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, you, you served like the big first words after a major angle and it's, it just, it didn't fit this, like being a, a fucking cell phone video. For one thing, like he did not look that hurt at all. Like, the only thing he no, did... No, wait, wait, he was grabbing his head. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the only thing he was doing to sell his injury was hold his head at the beginning of the video. As if, like, as if you're really injured, you couldn't stop not, holding not your head. Not a scratch on this guy. He's wearing, like, a polo shirt. Like, <laughs> I, I thought he looked like like he was just, like, coming off of, like, the golf course or something. He's um, trying to get into the G1 with oh, those God. looks. I thought this kind of like took the edge off of like that very serious angle and the promo itself. I didn't think was that great. I want to send you to the more. Come on. When you almost had a near death experience. Well, no pun intended, but I thought it was a little corny. The line. Yeah. Um, 
I, I didn't like this either. I thought it really was not a strong follow up, and and, and Lashley is uh, in, in this setting not not a great promo. I've heard this guy do great promos, but I've not seen one in WWE. Apollo Cruz and Andrade. Um, Double knees into the corner from Andrade. Cruz then sent him to the floor and hit a moonsault. They went to the commercial, came back. Uh, this was, again, a picture-in-picture picture one, so that's why you got the break. Insiguri from Cruz on the turnbuckle, military press. And then as Andrade went for a Pescado, he was caught on the floor by Cruz and tossed him. Zelina came off the apron with a Rana, sent Cruz back uh, into the desk with the Rana, and then into the ring where he was hit with the Hammerlock DDT and Andrade won. It was a good TV match, I thought. You know, um, good showcase for Andrade. I, I feel like this was almost a reintroduction to him of sorts because he's been away, obviously, due to some uh, uh, personal family issues. Um, so I just kind of felt like this was just a bit of a reintroduction to both he, him and Selena. Um, clearly, they give him a lot of wins. So I think they see him as a project. Um, so what program do you, do you see coming out of this? Is this the end of this Apollo thing? I think so. This felt like it was um I, I could see them getting um Carmella involved or or somebody um to kind of negate Zelina if they want to continue with this cuz I guess, I guess they left that part open ended with Zelina kind of causing the the loss. Um hmm. but I I'd personally like to see Andrade move above this. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that maybe Apollo didn't have much of a feud here with Andrade. In that if he d- does just kind of get thrown away uh, with Andrade advancing, it's sort of a shame because the man's moved like brand so many times and none of those like have kind of come with pushes that have endured. So I, d- I don't know what, what that means for him. Dolph and Kevin Owens were in the locker room. Owens says there's very little chance that they'll win tonight without a game plan. And suggests Dolph just look pretty on the apron. He'll do all the work. Ziggler makes another hot dog joke. Owen says, maybe Shane is right. Maybe we'll be great together. What's the worst that could happen if we try? They reluctantly agree. They shake hands. Ziggler makes another hot dog joke. And Owen says, after the show, they'll get hot dogs. Maybe that's the stipulation for Extreme Rules. Oh, a yeah. A hot dog eating contest. They've done that before in WWE. I believe they did it once with uh, Matt Hardy and MVP. Was it hot dogs? It- I think so, yeah. Oh my. I remember it being really gross. Uh, I believe uh, uh, ESPN 30 for 30 is releasing uh, an episode on uh, Kobayashi, uh, Kobayashi Kob- whatever. Uh, you oh. know the hot dog eating yeah. guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see. 30 for 30 hot dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chestnut versus uh, Takoru Kobayashi. Um, this is... Oh, it's a profile of like two rivals? Yeah, yeah, like oh, the, that's the, two awesome. most, the two most famous hot dog eating uh, contestants. Okay, I'll totally watch that. Yeah. Um, that sounds actually great. Actually, I believe it aired yesterday, so, or today. Well, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It, it's tough. Uh, I, I think that those two, they, they had a, a deep-seated hatred for each other because one year uh, Kobe, Kobayashi was getting so far ahead in the, the amount of hot dogs consumed and his opponent was forced to play catch up. <laughs> oh Jesus! Oh boy! Very good. I'm in a happy mood. You know why? Way? Why is that? Because my favorite segment was next. We're going to the room. So remember, everybody. Last we saw Alistair Black, <laughs> there was a knock on the door, and we were left with a. A giant grin from Alistair Black as if he was about to open the door and we were finally going to get an end to these. Last week, there was a knock on my door. And as I made my way and opened the door, there was no one there. Dude, I I fucking howled. I, I, I died. There was no one there. What the fuck was this? Like it was a bunch of kids playing yeah, a prank on him. Yeah, somebody's playing Nick Nick Nine doors there was, with. Yeah, Alistair there was Black. like burnt. Br- there was burnt shit at his doorstep. <laughs> there was no one there. Oh my Did, god! Didn't we have like a ray of light go into the door and he smiled at the person? Somehow my- the lights turned off. So I guess the light switch on, is on the outside of this door. Um, and yeah, there was like a ray of light. I guess. Fuck. 
There was no one there, and he applauds that person. For now, we are fighting on a physical and a spiritual plane. And I care little for your review. Okay. Clearly not listening to mine. Was that it? No, that is not it. That is the first two of five lines. I only care about you showing up at extreme rules. For if we shall fight in the heavens, we shall fight through the seven layers of hell. And if we met in purgatory, fighting we shall. And I find myself invigorated. For if you are man enough to knock on my door and reveal yourself at extreme rules as the person that picks a fight with me. Like, way, there is uh, some wonderful writers of our generation, but this takes the cake. Alistair Black, the, the poet laureate of this, this era. I, I have no idea what happened last week and how that led to this. Um, like, w- w- is there a chance that they just decided to... The, the person this? was looking for Mojo Raleigh, knocked on the wrong door, that's it. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Um, I don't know why they would have, like, done that last week if they weren't deciding to reveal it here. It just made Alistair Black look that much stupider. And it's like, man... So so, what is what is he saying there? He's promising a, a match at Extreme Rules, or yes. finally meeting this person at, at Extreme Rules. Yes. Okay, so he's got a match at Extreme Rules, but he doesn't know to whom. No, no. But they are going to fight in the heavens and through the seven layers of hell, which is kind of what I feel these weekly vignettes have been. I I'm just even more confused coming out of these, and I think Alistair Black looks that much dumber uh, at this point. Like they, they, these are full on into comedy for me at this at this point. Of and course. they have been for a few weeks now. Yeah. And, and they started. I was okay with them at the oh, beginning. Yeah. Um, I thought he was making the most of you know some promo time. It's an interesting way to introduce a guy, but this has become silly with the the, the door knocking. Uh, now there are some who have the theory that this could be Bray Wyatt who is yes. saying, "Let me in." And this guy is in a room. I, I don't think we're operating at that deep a level in WWE storytelling, but we will see if I stand corrected. Not only that, like, who do you book to win that feud? It, it's it's a clumsy one to put both guys who you've been building up opposite one another. Um, I, I would not go that direction. Also yeah. notable that this week was clear of Bray Wyatt involvement on the show, either show. Yeah, yeah, I didn't even see the Easter eggs pop up online anywhere. No. So, yeah, I wonder what's going on. Like, all of these, like, segments, Aleister Black and Bray Wyatt, feel like they were building up to debut this week, if not the week prior. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're just, could be that they, they're they deciding to maybe calm it down before surprising us. Did you really, like, do you think that's official? Like, Aleister Black is getting something? a match at extreme rules or is it just going to be revealed who he's going to who's been knocking on his door i guess oh i took this to mean he's having his match at extreme rules i thought it was such this is such a weird way to explain a match without an opponent like hmm anyway okay Ember Moon, Mandy Rose followed that. No entrances for either. Moon focused on Deville for whatever reason, allowing Mandy to jump her. There was a twisting suplex by Rose and a running knee strike. Stacked her for a two count. Moon comes back with the MX, a code breaker off the middle rope, and the Eclipse, and one in 216. Yeah, the feud continues. Um, Last week, I I guess we neglected to mention um, a bit of a gentle caress from Sonya Deville to Mandy Rose, which I think a lot of people you know, are looking at as perhaps an indicator of some type of storyline that they're trying to build. I don't know. Like they, they spent a lot of time on the two of them afterwards, after so uh, Rose lost this, this week as well. Mm-hmm. But um, it's, it's subtle enough that you, you can, it's, it's not, they're not really hitting you over the head with it. At least not this week. Then we might've had one of the, Strangest things I've seen in a long time. Shelton Benjamin is on camera. And he's asked who is going to win the WWE title at Extreme Rules. He does not answer. And his eyes just go in every direction. 
around the room. He smiles, and he walks away. I thought this was awesome. <laughs> I thought it was great. It was so weird. It was just like, and, and just completely, I think, the opposite of what you would expect from a pro wrestling promo especially from the wwe it was a non-promo it was like what do you have to say shelton and it was just like this grin on shelton's face and a close-up and cut like i'm this was memorable like you got you try to like ask me like what what are the like the big promos of the show okay you got kofi you got joe you got ali and then you got shelton benjamin i certainly remember this a lot more than the alistair black thing and then the main event, Kevin Owens and Dolph Ziggler against Heavy Machinery. We had Daniel Bryan, Xavier Woods, and Big E on commentary. Bryan at one point referred to Woods and Big E as knuckleheads that are making a mockery of the tag division. And Woods defends, saying they were the ones that rebuilt the division. Bryan says, you never headlined as champions. Several minutes later, Woods' rebuttal was that they headlined on SmackDown. And Bryan asked, yeah, what about on pay-per-view? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Brian notes that heavy machinery they're great athletes imagine if they were just serious so Brian is Jim Cornette on this show pretty much yeah like that's who he's channeling on commentary New Day eventually gets pissed off and jumps Rowan and Brian at ringside there's a running knee to Big E who didn't have a great night took two of these running knees Woods then takes out Brian. Ro- Rowan clotheslines Woods, destroys the commentary booth. Pancakes are everywhere, and Woods gets put through the table with an iron claw slam as Brian throws pancakes onto them. We go to a commercial break during this entire brawl on the floor where we're not even focused on the match. We come back, and they restart the match, which means we have now officially crossed the line where... We're not even coming up with reasons. We're just going to restart the match. We're not spending two hours coming up with a creative way to break up these segments. We're just going to fucking ring the bell. And that's it. They might as well. I they mean, might as well. You're right. Is it is it any worse than like having Gallows and Anderson come out all of a sudden and AJ saying, oh, I'm not going to continue this match until you guys leave? It's it's the same shit. I, I, again, I just feel bad for this group having to come up with these stupid reasons every single time. Like, this is just, it's getting stupid. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I've defended it more than most. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, ultimately, what did we get here? Like, did we get, what, two minutes of wrestling prior to the break? It was about that, yeah. I I mean. Dude, I threw my stopwatch in the garbage. Well, like, I mean, is it worth, is it worth two minutes? Rather, Rather than just having, like, guys come out, maybe cutting promos, taking longer with their entrances even, and then going to commercial break before starting the match after the commercial? I, at this point, I'd be fine if they cut out people's entrances and you just come back, they're in the ring, and the entrances are what take up the commercial. Well, I mean, ideally, that's, I guess, what you do. But what do you do with the content time before that? Yeah, you could do, you could do uh, a separate segment. You could do promos w- with guys coming out. Yeah. I mean, Brian didn't have to be on commentary for this. I mean, they could have done a segment with them otherwise. Anyway, um, I- I'm just... Like just getting tired. Like this was just like mm-hmm. we we don't want to even deal with this. Just just ring the bell when we come back from break. Want every single commercial break, match or no match in the ring. Let's just ring the bell. Okay. It's the start of a new segment. Mm-hmm. Tucker got sent to the floor. They worked over Tucker for a long time. Owens mocked Otis with his mannerisms. That part was funny. Eventually, Tucker made the big tag to Tucker, or Tucker made the hot tag to Otis, who came in. Attacked Ziggler, hit a spinning scoop slam. Uh, Ziggler came back with a jumping DDT, then tagged in Owens. There was an avalanche to Ziggler. Otis hits the caterpillar, but then Owens super kicked Otis. The stunner gets stopped, and then Ziggler misses Otis and super kicks his partner, Kevin Owens. Ziggler is sent to the floor. They hit the compactor, and Otis pins Owens. So heavy machinery is inserted into the tag title match at Extreme Rules. And after the match... Owens delivered a stunner to Ziggler, got a babyface reaction, and as Owens is yelling in the ring, the guy to the side yells, yell into the hard camera, and he did so, proclaiming, this is my show, and the audience chanted one more time. So, 
this felt like this was not just the audience re- reacting to this like a baby face. It was also Owens encouraging uh, that oh, yeah. baby face response. Like he was the total position baby face here. And this felt like a turn. Well, anytime he does the stunner, you know, he's he's a baby face. That's that's kind of how, you know. Um, so, yeah, I would say as a baby, as a turn, it kind of came out of nowhere and seemed to only be done out of convenience. Um, Rather than any type of like story reason, like he was a pretty clear heel with Sami Zayn all just last week, and this week it was almost like a completely different character. But to this audience, it worked fine. Um, whatever, whatever. I would say this edition of SmackDown. I thought the match, by the way, was was a good match for for the time that it had. Um, it was it, with a good finish. I think uh, heavy machinery are actually gaining a great deal of popularity with, with uh, most audiences, especially Otis. I think Tucker for his the, part, the crowd was into this, like yeah. especially Otis, like they, they, yeah. they're really into Otis. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they really kind of like managed to hold the crowd's attention in the main event slot of SmackDown. So credit to their ability to build heavy machinery up until this point. Um, but the show itself, I found it very kind of uh, similar to what we've had lately. I don't think it was a bad addition to SmackDown. It just maybe didn't have the, the same impact that Raw had. Maybe that's kind of unfair to to even compare it, knowing that, um, you know, Eric Bischoff hasn't hasn't uh, really gotten in, involved yet. But um, I thought it was, um, it was a bit of a mixed bag of SmackDown, but with a really strong Kofi and Joe segment in the middle. Um, decent three-minute matches. Again, if you're into three-minute matches, I like the Ali promo. Um, and then everything else is kind of kind of there. I think if you take out the Joe Kingston segment, uh, I did like the Ali promo. I, I thought this was a pretty weak edition of SmackDown. I, I didn't get into too much stuff in this show. It just felt like a lot of stuff didn't really hit the mark for me. I didn't enjoy that opening segment with, with Shane and Drew McIntyre. Um, Brian and Big E, it was okay. Um, the shorter matches, um, you know, that that is a drawback to this format is, you know, this is SmackDown in particular was a show that you could at least bank on a couple of strong matches given the talent that you had. And you're somewhat mortgaging that now for this new format where you're not going to be getting those blow away great matches. Um, so you're getting shorter matches. So on an, uh, that's fine for me. If you've got a lot of stuff in between that is strong content and, you know, between Alistair black, the opening segment, um, even the the Nikki Cross and Bailey thing, I don't think that really clicked to a, a big degree. But mm-hmm. man, I really love that Kingston Joe segment. Like that to me was uh, as strong a build as they've had for some time for a segment just to build up uh, a feud between these two. And they didn't have to go and do any big attack angle. They didn't have to do anything crazy. It was just two guys having. A, a promo segment together that just felt real and you want to see the match by the end of it. So I thoroughly enjoyed that portion of the show. So four promos to watch from this episode of SmackDown, Ali, Joe Kingston, Alistair Black and Shelton Benjamin. Oh yes. That one too. All right. Tonight's show, the forum gives this one a 6.72. Did this top raw? It might have. That shocks the hell I'm, sh- I'm absolutely shocked because Raw wow. blew this show away for me. Well, let's like, hear what they have to say. All right. Uh, why don't you start us off? Okay. Well, actually, I'm trying to look up Raw ra- Raw's rating. For, okay. For you you looked that up. It beat Raw. Raw, at this point, is a 6.36. Wow. Wow. That surprises me. Okay. We go to Jay from Colorado who says, that might have been the best Shelton Benjamin promo ever. Maybe the best <laughs> promo of all time. Also, Otis is and continues to be a global treasure. We all must do everything we can to cherish and honor him. Kofi's middle finger was a defining moment, in my opinion, and something that'll be played back in highlight reels for years to come. What are you talking about? They didn't have a clean shot of it. (laughs) Well, yeah, it went to black, didn't it? Uh, He says, I replayed it several times. And Kevin Owens was on fire. His promo on Dolph was perfect. Just like Raw last night, SmackDown felt different and fresh tonight. I don't know how much is due to Bischoff, but I'll be watching next week, although I will be skipping out on Extreme Rules. This needs to continue for a while before I consider renewing my subscription to the network. They fooled me in the past, and I'm not going to lie, they have my attention again. Okay, I think it'll be really interesting to see how many people are operating, like, or or watching this uh, based on, like, Eric Bischoff and thinking that there's something different, but 
Maybe yeah. there is. I don't know. And, and I think it is important to note, like, this is largely the same system and teams in place. Like, this is – Vince McMahon is, is running the production meetings. Like, Vince McMahon is in the, his same role. Like, this is – like, I'm sh- I'm certain in the coming weeks and months you are going to see uh, – you are going to see fingerprints. You are going to see maybe – uh, like that's the big question: How much you are going to see? Uh, I think they're incentivized to be open to more different ideas and presentation, and I think you got that on Monday. But at the end of the day, this is still like Vince McMahon overseeing these programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's go to AJ. Another good show from WWE, and it does feel like the product is starting to slowly climb out of the slump. SummerSlam always brings natural excitement for me, so hopefully they can capitalize on the momentum. I actually wish they kept Dolph and Owens together as a team. They had some good chemistry in that backstage segment. I liked the way the Kofi Joe segment ended. The middle finger was great, but I felt like they were cutting two different promos at one point. Kofi was verging on 2010 Cena territory, and fat jokes don't work for baby faces in 2019. They mostly elicit groans from the audience. Randy Orton is my, protect- is my prediction for the mystery door knocker. 8 out of 10. Hmm, okay. Orton and Black. I mean, they did the house show program together, um, and I think that's probably Mm -hmm. where he's coming up with Orton's name and also someone that is without any issue at the moment. He's just been off TV. Possible. We got a Paul from New Jersey who says, I found this to be a pretty solid episode. Good storyline progression. Heavy machinery has really impressed both Impressed me both cutting promos in and in the ring. Having Xavier and Brian on commentary was a nice touch as well. Um, Black really should have answered the door last week. If he did, he wouldn't have had to wait to know who his opponent is at Extreme Rules. If he isn't getting what he wants out of life, maybe he should look in the black mirror. Oh, wow. Mark writes, still improving, but not a fan of the amount of recaps from Raw on this show. It drags how often they go back. I love Joe as the smart psychological heel, and they did that segment without a negative cost to Kofi. Heels should be smart and intense, and so should faces. There was a great example of both getting a shine from their segment instead of one getting shine at the cost of the other. Also, maybe this is a sign of them going back to the original idea of Kevin Owens as an avatar for the average fan, saying what we only want to. The women's stuff could benefit from more of the sports-presented atmosphere, but at least tonight didn't have the salaciousness of last night. One weekend, and I'm interested in where both WWE shows go, which is good as I have not watched uh, watched weekly since WrestleMania season. Finally, we go to Hagaki, who says, Good show. WWE didn't make me feel like I wasted my time watching. Hopefully, it's more than placebo effect. The commercial break gimmick will get old before I get used to it, though. Owens was the MVP of the night. I think Owens had a very good night, um, and I think in a babyface role, um, yeah, it's it's another kind of reset for him and to see where they go with him uh, with this program and where he's positioned. So that is SmackDown, uh, and that is our show. Yeah, we'll be back tomorrow evening for our G1 Primer. I cannot wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. WH Park will be with us as we go through the entire tournament, which kicks off this Saturday night and runs through mid-August. 19 shows for everyone to get ready for, and Way and I will be covering them all. Uh, If you are a member of the Post Wrestling Cafe, you will be getting a show after every G1 tournament card. So look forward to that. If you're a member of the cafe, it's a great time to sign up. And that is it for us, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. You can go to postwrestling.com, postwrestlingcafe.com, and get your picks in. Postwrestling.com forward slash G1. It is free to join. And maybe our tiebreaker question will be, who is the most handsome member of the entire field? Yeah, that's what I'm most interested in. Goto versus Taichi. I suddenly want to see this match now. Wow. Well, that is it. Good night and goodbye.